All right, welcome to The Explainer, where we try to make sense of some pretty big topics. And today, we are tackling one of the absolute giants of economics, gross domestic product. You've heard of it, right? GDP. Okay, so to really get our heads around this, let's start with a super simple but really core idea. I mean, this is the thing that underpins everything else we're going to talk about today. It all starts with just one single transaction. And that transaction leads us to this. This one idea that every dollar spent is a dollar earned is the absolute key to understanding how we can possibly measure something as massive as a whole country's economy. It seems too simple, right? But for the economy as a whole, it's a rock solid rule. Total income has to equal total spending. So let's make this real with a tiny little economy. Nala pays James 50 bucks to mow her lawn. Now, what just happened? Well, two things at the exact same time. Nala's spending, or expenditure, went up by $50. And you guessed it, James's income went up by $50. See? They're just two sides of the exact same coin. The transaction created both at once. Okay, so that was just one lawn. Now, let's zoom out and imagine millions and millions of transactions like that happening every single day. What you get is this amazing circular flow of money. Think about it. We, households, we sell our labor to companies. The companies then pay us wages, right? That's our income. And what do we do with that income? We turn right around and use it to buy stuff from those very same companies. Our spending becomes their revenue. It's just this giant, continuous loop. And that massive, nonstop flow of money and value? Well, that has a name you've definitely heard a million times. It's gross domestic product. At its heart, GDP is just our attempt to measure the total size of that flow. So what is GDP really? Let's get into the nitty gritty and build the official definition piece by piece. First up, market value. GDP has to add up all sorts of different things. Cars, coffee, computer code, you name it. How do you do that? You use their market prices. It's the only way to get a common unit, right? To turn everything into dollars. Now the flip side of that is pretty important. If something doesn't have a market value, like say the childcare you do at home for your own kids, it's not counted. Okay, next piece of the puzzle. Of all final, this is so, so important. GDP only counts final goods. So think about a pizza. GDP counts the price you pay for the finished pizza at the restaurant. It doesn't count the flour the restaurant bought, or the cheese, or the tomatoes. Why not? Well, because the value of all those ingredients is already baked into the price of the final pizza. If we counted both, we'd be double counting, and the number would be way off. All right, what about the D in GDP? That stands for domestic, and that's all about where the stuff is made. It means we're measuring the value of everything produced within a country's borders. It doesn't matter who owns the factory. So a car built by a Japanese company in a plant in Ohio, that counts towards US GDP. But a car built by an American company in a plant in Mexico, nope, that counts for Mexico's GDP. And the last piece of our definition, in a given period of time, this is key. GDP isn't a snapshot of a country's total wealth. It's a flow. It's like measuring how much water is flowing through a pipe over a specific period, usually a year or a quarter. So we're only counting goods and services produced right now. If you sell your used car from 2018, that transaction doesn't get added to this year's GDP because its value was already counted back in 2018 when it was first made. So let's put it all together. GDP is the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. Boom, there it is. Every single word in that sentence is doing some heavy lifting to make sure we're measuring the economy in a consistent and meaningful way. Okay, so now that we know what GDP is, how do we actually calculate it? Well, economists like to break it down into four big categories of spending. It helps us see who is doing the buying in the economy. And it all comes together in this famous little equation, y equals c plus i plus g plus nx. Let's break down what those letters mean. C is for consumption. That's basically all the stuff that households like you and me buy. Food, clothes, movie tickets, you name it. I is for investment. Now, this isn't stocks and bonds. In econ speak, this means businesses buying new equipment or building new factories. And it also includes people buying new houses. G is for government purchases. Think roads, schools, military spending. And finally, an X is net exports. That's just the value of everything we sell to other countries, our exports, minus the value of everything we buy from them, our imports. And when you look at how this breaks down for a country like the United States, one thing just jumps right out at you. Look at that chart. Consumption, regular people buying stuff, is huge. In 2021, it was nearly 70% of the entire economy. 
That's why you always hear people talking about consumer confidence. It is by far the biggest engine of the U.S. economy. But this brings up a really, really important question. A potential problem, really. If we're just adding up market prices, what happens if all the prices in the economy go up? You know, inflation. The GDP number would get bigger, for sure. But does that actually mean our economy is growing? Are we producing more things, or are we just paying more for the same amount of things? This is a huge deal. And to solve it, economists came up with two different ways to talk about GDP. First, there's nominal GDP. That's the one that uses today's prices. It's simple, but it's not corrected for inflation. Then we have the really useful one, real GDP. This is the clever one. It values everything using prices from some past year, a base year, which basically strips out the effect of rising prices. Okay, let's see this in action. Imagine a super simple economy that only makes pizza and chocolate. If we calculate nominal GDP, wow, look at that jump from 2021 to 2022. It went up by almost 43%. But wait a second, look closely. Both the prices went up and the quantity we produced went up. So that big 43% number is mixing two different things together. How much of that is real growth and how much is just things getting more expensive? This is where real GDP comes to the rescue. What we do is we freeze the prices at the 2021 level. We pretend prices never changed, and then we just calculate the value using the new, higher quantities from 2022 and 2023. And look what happens. The growth is still there for sure, but it's a much more realistic 28.6% in that first year. That number tells us the true increase in how much pizza and chocolate we actually made. And that's exactly why whenever you hear a politician or a news anchor talking about economic growth, they are almost always talking about the change in real GDP. It's the only way to get a true picture of whether the economy is actually producing more stuff without all the confusing noise from inflation. Okay, so this brings us to maybe the biggest, most important question of all. We spent all this time carefully defining this number GDP, but does a bigger GDP actually mean a better life? Is a country with a high GDP automatically a great place to live? Well, not everyone thinks so. Way back in 1968, Senator Robert Kennedy gave this incredibly powerful speech where he pointed out some really big problems with being obsessed with GDP. He basically said it measures everything except the things that actually make life worthwhile. And you know what? He had a really good point. GDP doesn't measure our leisure time. It doesn't tell us if our environment is healthy. It completely ignores all the valuable work done at home or by volunteers. And it says nothing about whether income is distributed fairly or if it all goes to a tiny group at the top. So if GDP has all these flaws, if it misses so much of what we care about, why do we still pay so much attention to it? Why is it still the number one economic statistic that everyone, from world leaders to investors, watches so closely? Well, the answer is pretty simple, actually. Because even though a high GDP isn't the goal of life, it's a really good tool for achieving a better life. Just take a look at this. There's a really strong connection here. Countries with a higher GDP per person tend to have people who live longer. It makes sense, right? A richer country can afford better health care, cleaner water, and healthier food for its citizens. And we see the same thing when we look at life satisfaction. Now, money can't buy happiness, we all know that. But it sure seems like people in countries with higher GDP report being more satisfied with their lives. So what's the takeaway here? GDP is not a perfect measure of well-being, not by a long shot. But it is a measure of our ability to obtain many of the inputs for a worthwhile life. It may not measure everything that matters, but it does measure something that matters a whole lot. 